Welcome. I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. It's time to take a close look at those recalls, what happened behind the scenes and what it means for the future. A little later in the program, we'll talk to a couple reporters about the political impact. But first, I want to get the story of what happened on the ground. As you know, we had two state senators that got beat. One was very close, and that was the one in Colorado Springs, but the one in Pueblo was different. I want to introduce you to Becky Mizell, who's the GOP uh, uh, chairman in that in that uh, area, Pueblo. Yes, thank How long you have for you been having in us on. I am born and raised. I'm a Pueblo girl. I went, went to Dallas for 16 years, but I came back to raise my son back in Colorado. I'm a Colorado Pueblo girl. So, right. now you understand Colorado has changed. We we're very urban centric here. Yes, Denver. Denver is a representation of all of Colorado. <laughs> Not and to all of us. No, no, all of Colorado. <laughs> what what goes on in Denver, this this people in the rest of the state are just like people in urban Denver. Exactly. That's why we have now a governor of, of, of Denver. What's the big difference in personality between the city center here and Pueblo? What what's different? Well, I think what's different is Pueblo has felt the full impact of what a poor economy will do and um, how citizens are disempowered because uh, they have no voice left in the economy, basically. And so you have, um, Pueblo used to be a very uh, center town where you could count on raising your children there and that kind of thing, but now there's no hope that your children will stay in the commu same community as you. Because so when they grow up, it used up, to be a multi-generational they might, they community. Might and it really has, it has a, an incredible <laughs> history. Right, former steel town. Two different recalls. In Colorado Springs, the president of the Senate lost by less than 400 votes. About 278. Mm -hmm. 278, holy moly. Mm -hmm. Alright, so it got, it got every vote counted. The line, that is the odds, the Vegas odds on Angela Harone losing was uh, winning, well, let me put it this way, of the Gunnies winning and her losing wasn't very good. No. You, know, you looked at the demographics and the demographics were this is an overwhelmingly democratic not Republican area, where her district is two to one, something like that, Republicans, if I, if I have that right. Pueblo is considered the stronghold of the Democrat Party in, it is. in it Colorado. Is, it is the stronghold, but mm -hmm. it's a different type of Democrat. Yes. Now, let, me, let me put this out and see if I'm, if I'm right. Colorado has had Democratic majorities in, in the legislature lots of times, uh, but they've been country, working, union friendly, Democrats. They haven't been hard-edged, tough-nosed progressives hell-bent on a different agenda. Exactly. The Democrats now seem to be a little bit different, Angela Harone among them. Would I be right? You'd be totally correct. I, I would describe those people more your Ivy League, educated by college type Democrats that have come out of the universities. And that's not and the Democrat Party of the working person in, in Pueblo. And, and, they, still and they know how you should live. Exactly. And after this legislation, legislation you should live without a gun or without mm -hmm. a magazine that has 15 rounds and if you're going to lend your gun to your neighbor you got to go through some some sort of stuff why were those laws so very offensive in Pueblo well Pueblo it still remains there's a lot of hunters in Pueblo and that kind of thing plus a lot of the people that became most of the people that really became active in this movement were not involved in politics before so they really thought if they went to a town hall meeting and met with Angela in mass and their voices would be heard that they would listen. Now, they haven't really been in politics, so they may not know necessarily, politici politicians don't necessarily listen. So they were like 1,200, 1,500 people at a town hall meeting, and she would go, pretty much scoff them off, close the doors, and not listen. And they kept attempting and attempting to say, please, Angela, listen to us. And she turned them away. It's not, it was, of course, the gun issue, the Second Amendment issue, but it was also the fact that it was so blatantly not listening to her constituents. There was an arrogance. With yes. both of these legislators, there was yes. a smugness that was palpable. We know better than you. Now, now, what I've heard is that, you know, yeah, yeah, you, you, you townsfolk did all mm -hmm. this. Um, but really, it was the out-of-state interest. It was the NRA. It was gun-owning organizations that said, you know what, we're going to target her. We're going to bring our organization down. We're going to do this dirty work. Um, I want to hear the real story. Tell me, tell me who Victor Head is and the partnership you've had. Victor Head, um, I had met Victor because we knew about the Second Amendment and he hung out at the, um, our military surplus store and I met him. He's 28. He and his brother are plumbers 
plumbers. And they, yes, plumbers. Ivy League, Ivy League yes, educated exactly, plumbers. Yes, exactly, but smart as they know the Constitution like you would not believe. And they went to those meetings and she would try to shut them out and they said, you work for us, you know, and th those kind of things. And I thought, who are these plumbers that know the Constitution so well? And so they, Victor is just a smart, savvy guy. And so I went with Victor because I, I'm a huge Second Amendment advocate. If it would have been a Republican, John, I've got to tell you that voted those ways, I would be right along with them to recall. I, I feel that strongly about the Second Amendment. If I have the story right, all the money came from Denver and we gave it all to Victor Head and to you to go out and do the, <laughs> do the petitioning required. And there was a large amount of petitions that need to get um, uh, sent in. How did you get the petitioning done? Well, first of all, we did go to that Broadmoor meeting. There was a big Broadmoor for a meeting around the state of everyone who wanted to recall. There were four to five counties that wanted to recall. Everyone said, okay, there's going to be money for all of you. But when it came to Victor and I and we said, we want to recall Angela Heron, they said there won't be many money. We don't think Who's they, by the way? Um, it was the powers to be that they were hoping NRA and people like that would jump in and help. And right. so they, that didn't and they happen. said Pueblo will never get the money. That didn't happen. Victor had knew this was a homegrown effort. There was no money. If Victor I understand, went home to his grandma yeah. and took a $4,000 loan out from his grandmother to get it off the ground. $4,000 loan yes. from grandma. Mm -hmm. Now, I know a lot about petitioning because I've petitioned lots of things on the ballot. And it takes a lot to get a good accuracy rate, right. which is that the people that sign are actually registered voters and they live where they're supposed to live. You guys had a 96% accuracy rate. Right. To give you a, a, the, the tax increase that's on the ballot now, they got something like a 52% accuracy rate. How did you do that? Well, Secretary Gessler, um, we'd been doing voter registration drives all along, and the secretary did tell us the best way to do it is just take your laptops around and, you know, use your devices and go straight to the Secretary of State's, State's site. And so I talked with Victor. Victor took that, and, of course, they're younger techie people, so that was so easy for them. So they didn't let anybody sign that they couldn't prove um, pretty much that were in the district for right. a registered just, It's an voter. open record. You just went right. online mm -hmm. and verified it right. before they signed. And they were really Who strict. Who would have thunk? Mm -hmm. How many people were involved in getting those uh, recall petitions? Did, did you buy any petitioners? There wasn't one paid petitioner. Not, Not one, one paid petitioner. No. And how many petitions did you get in? Um, there were 13,800, I believe. And because it was kind of narrow, um, we were written off then, too, because they thought certainly you wouldn't get the accuracy rate needed. I think it was actually 14. But anyway, um, it had about a 6% kick-out rate because we were written off then because we didn't get the margin. Um, right. They thought for sure we wouldn't get those. All right. Fight goes on. Yes. And lo and behold, you guys actually had a great rate of accuracy. The uh, fight's on. Angela Huron looks at this and goes, well, come on. This is a Democratic town. I'm the Democratic uh, uh, legislator. We don't need to worry about it. All eyes went, and as it turns out, rightfully so, to the president of the Senate's race uh, being much tighter. But you were written off. Can we go back a tiny bit? Please. They were starting to get a bit nervous when they saw we were getting close to the petition signatures. So that's when they started bringing in the outside people from New York and places like that to try to block the petitioners, paid people. They were actually shown paying people off $20 bills at a time to not sign the petition and to be out there demonstrating. And that was on film all over I remember. YouTube. I've seen it. Mm -hmm. It was good stuff. So they really tried blocking then. And those people came and they never left. And then go ahead all with right. the petitions. But, mm -hmm. but still, all right, so the fight went, goes on. Two to one advantage for Democrats. This ain't going to happen. I mean, I, and I've got to tell you, I was hoping it would happen. I was uncertain whether or not <laughs> this could happen. How did you win in a landslide against Angela Heron? One other thing with petitions, they had paid petitioners going around door to door of every single person that signed the petition. Democrat, the Democrats who signed really got a lot of pressure to take their name off in independence. I don't know if you know about that. There wasn't one person who signed the petition that did not take their name off the petition. Really? Yes. So, that's kind of an unknown story. That so the Democrats who signed that petition said, you can pressure me all you like. Yes. I'm not removing my name from that. And it was a full court press. Yes. Wow. What kind mm -hmm. of things would they do? They would go to the door and, and intimidate. How so? They would knock on the door and they say, we understand you signed this petition. Do you really know what you were doing? You know, this is Angela. She's in our community. Why would you do this? It was very, very. And she's of your party. Yes. She's a Democrat like you. Why would you do this to exactly. a Democrat? Mm-hmm. All right. So that went on too. Fight goes on, 
and she's got a lot of money. Now, I understand the NRA just threw money at you like it was a fire hose, <laughs> that this was, this was the NRA pushing lots, lots and lots of money on you. Well, we were really thinking that we would get a lot of money, to be honest, but I don't know if, if people just thought it couldn't really happen still, and so the, the spouts weren't on or what, but they certainly didn't think it would happen in Pueblo. I do know for a fact that El Paso did get more money than we did in Pueblo because of the odds. You know, when, when you say money, you're talking NRA money. NRA money and some different money coming but from that, different that organizations. that money came in very late. And yes. I, I see two real big differences. One, money came in very, very late. Mm -hmm. Two, it wasn't nearly as much money as the Bloomberg machine brought no. in. But also the NRA has members in their association right there, National Rifle Association, and they come to the rescue of uh, members who are in trouble. Bloomberg had nobody there. There was nobody <laughs> part of the Bloomberg Association who's paid dues in their lifetime membership to this organization. You know, the it teachers shows you union. Though how he's taken yeah. over the, the right. Democrat Party in our state, though, right? Yeah, it is. They listened to amazing. Bloomberg. What happened during the the campaign? What what was different between your campaign and Angela's campaign? Um, I think there was an air of haughtiness and arrogance that we didn't really have, and we brought in our Republican candidate. And so it was almost a two-pronged effort because Pueblo Freedom and Rights kept on doing what they did, and we did kind of what we did as Republicans, and we started reaching out to the independents and the Republicans to make sure they got to the polls. A lot of Republicans, even at the very top, did not believe in this recall. And I had to fight sometimes our own party to say, okay, guys, this is it. We're all on board. Please help us. Well, and once the trigger's pulled, the trigger's pulled. Exactly. The horse is out of the barn. Let me be the first to say these recalls were remarkably risky. As a, as a gun owner and somebody who cares about it, if this went the other way, I think it could have been really damaging to our cause. It would have made uh, Morris this hero who would be uh, brought around to all the other state legislators. He'd be Rachel Maddow's little pet. It mm -hmm. would be just terrific. It was a risky move and it has paid off in spades. It was risky, but if you don't know your community, and this is where I say grow the party from the grassroots, when you pay attention to the people in your community, it really it wasn't really about party at all, and we really kept it away from party hey, how politics. Many, how many Democrats signed the petition? About 2,300, maybe 2,700. Wow, so a, a, a good 20% it sounds yes. like. Yes. Mm -hmm. So 20% of that. Uh, what was the turnout? As far as the, the parties? Um, we actually had 48.9% turnout of our um, Republicans, whereas El Paso only had 23% of their base turnout, wow. which is really interesting. What about Democrats? Um, Democrats were about, I think it was 30%, don't quote me. But and we the ending, numbers, the ending mm -hmm. numbers turned out to be what? For over 4,000 votes. Was that Vote, as a percentage? Yes, recall. Um, it was 48, uh, it was, we won by 12 percentage points. 12, 12 percentage, percentage point. points. Mm -hmm. That's a shellacking. It That's was. That's incredible. All right, last question. If you could put all this into one, one message, why did Angela Harone get recalled from a Democratic stronghold like Pueblo? How did she get recalled? Why? She didn't listen to the people, and she was seen as listening to West, um, Bloomberg money. She was seen as an advocate of Denver. Um, metrocentric. She was also lobbied to take away um, water from our area, um, crazy green energy schemes that are going to really cost farming and things like that. And that's where we started hammering on the other issues. Because some people, it didn't resonate, the Second Amendment. Is, don't there, get is it. there a war on rural Colorado? Yes. And that's really where we hit it also. Becky, congratulations. What a story. Thank you. You stay tuned.